This is SiriusXM and Garmin Understanding Fish Mapping. Thank you for joining us. We actually have the SiriusXM and Garmin weather webinar coming up next week. So if you wanna register for that one as well, you can go to SiriusXM.com forward slash marine webinars. All right, here we go. So I'm Jeff Leach, based out of the Maryland uh, area, and uh, we have Dal Thornton. Thank you, Dal, for joining us tonight from Garmin. Glad to be here. And Dan Dickerson, fighting a white marlin in that shot, aren't you, Dan? Uh, I believe it was. Yeah, mm. great. We also have Ryan Farner, who is one of our Garmin and SiriusXM Marine pros. Uh, he's a pro ambassador, and, and he, uh, Ryan, you fish out of Tampa and the Keys, right? Uh, Tampa Bay Keys, yeah, Northern Gulf, Bahamas, you know, whatever, wherever the bite is during the, during the seasons. Excellent. Thank you for taking the time and, and joining us tonight. And so, and so for those of you that, were, that are on this webinar call tonight, if you have, do have questions um, for Ryan, we're going to let him go a little early, but we'll, we'll go through the first section at least and chat your questions for Ryan, um, if you would, um, while, uh, while we have him. All right. So you may already be aware that SiriusXM Marine delivers up-to-date graphical weather directly on your multifunction display. It's not cell-based, so you're not looking at a smartphone. It's not an app. This is satellite-based service. Um, and if you look at the map on the right-hand side, the light blue area is roughly our coverage area. So it's roughly 150 nautical miles around uh, the North American area that you see there. Um, and, and, you know, typically when you're going offshore, uh, somewhere in the six to eight to 10 mile range, you completely lose terrestrial radio and you lose cellular signal. Uh, and as such, um, we're not contingent on those signals. We deliver the broadcast directly from our Sirius XM satellites down to your boat via a weather receiver. <clears throat> All right, next slide, Dan. All right, so if you're, so we're talking about fish mapping tonight, uh, but really thought we'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about weather because weather is a huge portion of fish mapping. Uh, in fact, fish mapping is a superset and it comes with the offshore weather tier, which is the highest tier of weather. Uh, um, so um, some features here um, that are very popular amongst our audience, our subscribers, uh, and what you're looking at mid-screen with that 76.5 is sea surface temperatures. So that's graphical sea surface temperatures. You're looking at weather radar, of course, and you're looking at lightning strikes. Um, if you're not familiar with Sirius XM weather, we have a whole host of videos on it. And again, we do have that webinar next week on weather. We encourage you to attend because weather is critical um, when you're going offshore. All right, fish mapping, again, makes up uh, the offshore weather service as well as eight dedicated fishing specific um, features. And we're gonna walk through each one of those features um, tonight on this webinar. Before we do that, we wanna tell you where we get this data from. So we have a partnership with a group called Maxar Technologies. Maxar is pretty famous and well-known publicly traded company because they provide Google Earth imagery, um, the satellite imagery for Google Earth. Um, they also have a team of oceanographers that collect and analyze satellite data from NASA, NOAA, and other sources, and then have been providing it for several decades around the world for the commercial and government entities to both uh, establish and regulate slash monitor um, fishing. Um, in various locations around the world. So we're happy to be partnered with them. We do get specific reports and updates and details and data from them on a daily basis. Getting started on SiriusXM Marine Fish Mapping, uh, we start out by being here on the home screen. And this is using the uh, latest version of Garmin software that was just released a few weeks back. Uh, so it may look a little different to some folks out there. Uh, now you have a, a home button down here at the bottom. And when you click on it, uh, then it brings up this screen where you can now select uh, the fish mapping option if you have subscribed. 
So we select fish mapping, it takes us back to this screen, and then we go over here to the options category. And when we select the uh, options, we get our pop-up window that gives us our first fish mapping menu you can see here at the top. So from there, um, we then select the layers button and we have a legend button, which I have the legend turned on, typically do keep it turned on. Um, it's kind of helpful to have the, uh, the information shown up and you'll see that as we go along. Um, there's a subscription button as well. Um, and we're gonna take a look at that subscription button first. When you select it, it brings up this information, which is kind of helpful. Uh, nice thing to check, maybe when you first get on the boat, fire everything's up, make sure the subscription is working properly and coming in. Um, it also uh, identifies the age of the fish mapping layers uh, and fish, fishing recommendations uh, update twice a week, Tuesday and Friday mornings. We'll talk more about those as we go along. Uh, most of the features in this set uh, update daily. The plankton concentration, plankton fronts, the subsurface temperatures, height anomalies, which are your upwellings and downwellings, and your sea surface temperature front strength and weed lines. And then lastly, we've got uh, sea surface temperature contours. Those update every 12 hours. Um, and the sea temperature information is, is also something that's been improved upon. Uh, there used to be three hour updates, but they were updates to a three to seven day average. Uh, there's a new satellite up now that in addition to infrared uses microwave technology and allows us to punch through the clouds. So there's no longer any restrictions caused by cloud cover. Uh, and consequently the, the forecast has become much more accurate and we've stopped doing the average. Now it is a real time surface temperature uh, report that's given every 12 hours. And then the next thing on this screen is uh, the, this screen will, will rotate back and forth between the, the first page there, that page and this page. And this tells you uh, when the data came into your unit. So we can see here when I took this shot that uh, some of the information was 10 minutes old, some of it was eight minutes old and so forth. All of these layers are designed to come out basically overnight. Um, so you've got them when you're heading out in the morning be it the ones that come out twice a week or daily or uh, every 12 hours. Of course, that's a little different. That's every 12, but still uh, designed to come out uh, when, you're, when you're heading out in the morning. So next, going back to the uh, menu page, uh, we're now gonna go into the layers and these are our primary fish mapping layers. Uh, and we're gonna go take a look at sea temperature first. So by selecting sea surface temperature, now you have three choices. The first one being surface contours. So that's your sea surface temperature information. And those of you that have used our weather service in the past uh, have been using a, a color format. Uh, the, the, the color of the water changes to show you the temperature. Well, because we're showing you so much more information here, uh, we're using a, just a contour line instead. And you've got a a number written along the contour line that's giving you the temperature. So we're seeing 76 degree water here, 74 degree water over here and so forth. The other new feature you have here is when you have the uh, sea surface temperature uh, turned on, you'll notice there's a no new button that pops up that says sea temp limit. And what that gives you the ability to do is go in and adjust the temperature range that you're looking at. So I've zoomed in here a little bit uh, near Hatteras, and we're looking right now, the, the lower limit is set to 32 degrees and the upper limit is set to 99 degrees. And on screen, we're seeing a temperature range of about 58 to oh, 76 degrees here for the temperatures in this area. Well, I can go in and adjust those limits. So if I adjust those limits, now I've narrowed it down from 72 degrees at the lower end and 76. So we're looking at a very narrow temperature window and you can see on screen how now we're seeing right where there's just those very high temperatures. And that was taken just a few days ago. Basically, that's the Gulf Stream that's ripping past Hatteras right now and heating up the water in that area. So next, we go back into the sea temperature mode. 
and we select the 30 meter subsurface temperature. So I'm gonna skip over the middle one for just a minute here um, and talk about, we looked at, we just looked at surface temperatures. Now we're gonna go look at temperatures approximately 100 feet down. So uh, the, the folks over at Maxar, uh, they basically have a software algorithm that calculates the subsurface water temperature and it's been proven to be extremely accurate. Uh, so what we're seeing on here is that same area in Hatteras, only now we're looking at what the water depth is 100 feet down. And of course, over here, we're not seeing any contours because the water there is too shallow. So basically it kicks in right where the, the 100 foot drop off is. So there it is on full screen. And you can see again, here's the Gulf Stream at 100 feet down, we're still looking at 75 degree water right here. Now, the other interesting thing we can do using this capability is uh, look at the two side by side to compare the surface to the subsurface, which is kind of interesting. So here I've done a split screen and I'm seeing my surface temperature on one side and my subsurface temperature on the other side. Uh, and you can see I've marked a waypoint and I named the waypoint what the surface temperature was, 76 degrees right there. Same exact lat lawn over here we're looking at 68 degrees. So you've got quite, a, quite a, uh, a little temperature difference. Now, where we're finding this can be really helpful, not only in areas like this, where you're trying to find the edge of the Gulf Stream, but in Florida, for example, in the summertime, when the surface water is all 80 degrees, being able to find a cooler spot a little bit lower down is really helpful in finding where there might be some bait fish activity. So next we're gonna go back into sea temp again, and we're gonna go look at the surface front strength category. Now this is where the oceanographers get involved. Um, they basically uh, look at the temperatures and then they apply external factors like winds and ocean currents and so forth. And they identify for us, for you, where your best temperature breaks are going to be occurring. And it's done in a number scale of one to four. So you can simply put the cursor, you can tap on screen. There are also, you'll see there's numbers on screen there that are giving you the, the different temperature fronts, one being weak, two moderate, three strong, and four, a number four being you're very strong. You can also see it's color coded. And in the legend, it's identifying the, the different color, color variables. So we can see the different areas. So if you're headed out, you know, if you can get on a number three or number four temperature front, these are one of the best, most reliable features that we have as part of the service is being able to use your temperature fronts. And you're gonna kind of use these like you used to use the temperature breaks on the old fashioned color type temperature readout. This is just a little cleaner, number one to four, see if you can find a three or a four if there's one in your area. If not, by all means, a one or two is better than nothing, but a three or four is gonna give you your best chance of getting on some bait fish. All right, so let's pause there. Um, if there are any questions that you guys have, please chat them. Um, Ryan, while we have you, and happy for you, I know you're not feeling great, so happy for you to uh, head off after this, but any insights, feedback, suggestions um, that you have, or maybe uh, short stories that you want to share at this section, and, and we'll open it up again for chat questions for anybody mm -hmm. who has questions yeah. for you or us. Sure, um, well, what they were just focusing on, on the subsea surface temperature versus the temperature front strength or, you know, just your random sea surface temperatures on the top of the water. What's really important and, and it comes into play, especially fishing in like the Key West, the Bahamas uh, and the Gulf, you know, you get a lot of the same color or, or same temperature water, you know, on the top. Um, it's the trick is, is finding that, you know, upwellings and those, subsea surface temperatures that are changing or that are dramatically different than the others is where we always tend to find fish in the summer. So that was good that he pointed that out. Excellent, good. Um, Franklin um, mentioned, is the color coding for temperatures no longer available? You wanna uh, address that graphical um, temps, uh, Dan? Yeah, sure. Um, so the, the color temperatures are certainly still available. They're just not a uh, part of the fish mapping layers. However, the fish mapping package, when you're subscribed to it, you still do receive all of the other weather data 
that was part of or is part of the marine offshore package, which does include your temperature readouts. You're just not able to combine these layers on the same screen uh, as the, the surface layers. Basically, you have to go back to your, to your home screen here and choose the, uh, the sea temperature. Uh, there's a sea temperature button instead of a fish mapping button that you can select. Right, keep the questions coming. We will stop um, throughout this webinar um, and um, answer any of your questions. So if you have them while we're talking, just chat them and we'll, um, we'll stop again after the next section. <clears throat> All right, so the next series of features, we're gonna go into plankton. So remember there's two plankton features, plankton contours, which is showing you the contour lines of the density of plankton. So um, this is milligrams per cubic meter. You'll notice that the lines that are lighter in shading are lower density of plankton. And then the lines that are darker are higher density. And you can also see the numbers allocated on those lines that, that represent um, milligrams per cubic meter. So those are contours. Then we're gonna go into plankton front strengths um, and this is much like uh, sea surface temperature front strengths that Dan was just uh, describing. So these are graded, are labeled on a scale of two to four. So unlike sea surface temperatures, there is not a one because there's no point of having a weak plankton front. Um, what we really wanna show you is two, which is moderate, three, which is strong, and four, which is very strong. Um, and you're really looking for those threes and fours if you can. So these are the fronts that are the densest areas of plankton that abut or adjacent to areas that are not so dense, uh, tend to be areas where bait fish congregate and also areas where pelagic fish hunt those bait fish. Uh, so threes and fours are really the key for plankton fronts. And Ryan, if you're still with us, I think you got a story on plankton fronts, don't you? Uh, I mean... Plenty of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, How about the I mean, stacking a, up of the weeds in the boat? And... As I'm sure the, the rest of the folks that are on here will learn, you know, in the upcoming seminar here, like wherever there's conversion zones or especially, you know, the higher the plankton number, just like the higher the, the um, sea surface temperature front strength is, et cetera, you know, in all the features, um, you're going to find fish, especially where they converge. And uh, yeah, I, I found a, you know, a floating boat that had sunk a 47 foot center console that had sunk off of Tampa Bay a year prior, a couple of commercial fishermen had seen it in the, up in the Northern Gulf throughout the year. And, you know, it was upside down, had barnacles on it and whatnot. And I found it almost a year later to the date it sunk uh, off Key West. And it was on a, you know, a conversion zone well outside of, uh, you know, of, um, of the wall there. I mean, I was, I was like 11 miles offshore of that. And it had, it had shown us, you know, that we had high temperature front strength, plankton front strength, temperature front strength, everything was converging in this beautiful, like X marks the spot. And sure enough, it was, it was an amazing day. Wahoos, dolphins, blue marlins. It was crazy. And that boat floated for four more days and, you know, the, the fish map being tracked that same current and that same water up through it. And, you know, it was found and, and resalvaged. Uh, I don't think anything happened to it, but it was a very cool story and uh, killer day of fishing. And I definitely wouldn't have gone there if I didn't have fish mapping at my fingertips. That's for sure. That's a cool story. So case in point, you know, often when you see converging fronts, they attract, you know, weeds and other flotsam and, and things that are out there in the water. Um, as, as they're typically represent boundaries of water. Um, all right, so this area right here too, plankton fronts also come in handy. Oftentimes in the summer, a lot of the times in Florida, it's just a big mush out there, right? There's not a whole lot of sea surface temperature breaks out there that you can even define. I mean, you look sometimes for a one degree break is substantial. Well, in this case, and this was, uh, I think a summer ago, um, the anglers went out and just found a number four, really very strong plankton front and caught, uh, the winning sailfish on this spot. So in the absence of one feature, uh, look for other features. 
you definitely have to think a little bit through some of these features and, and how they're useful. But, you know, it's, it's already been said, and we're going to review it and hopefully drill this point into anybody listening to this mm-hmm. webinar, is that the more features that stack up together with strong or very strong fronts, uh, or, you know, that is the where you're optimally looking for finding fish. Going back to the person that asked about the colored sea surface temperature, just to give you an example here, this, I did a split screen. So this is something you can bring up on your Garmin. You can see the color temperature on one side and see some of the fish mapping layers on the other side. So you can see everything all at the same time. And of course, if, if the boat was there, the boat would also be showing up center of screen. So you'd have situational awareness of what's going on on both screens. Yep. Although the screen on the left is not a great representation of graphical weather or graph, graphical uh, sea surface temperature because it's, it's pretty washed out, as you can see. There's not a clearly delineated break there, but nonetheless, you can do it. All right, so now we're going to talk about sea surface height anomaly, uh, and there's kind of a lot to unpack here. Um, so. There is the sea level, there is a consistent, you know, basic or standard sea level, right? Uh, And the ocean is constantly rising and falling. Well, it doesn't rise and fall consistently in all areas. Some areas rise and some areas fall. When those two areas are adjacent to each other, uh, and in this particular case, we're looking at an upwelling, a little confusing, but an upwelling is represented by a negative number. So ultimately what that means as sea level is down and then it is going to start rising and turning into an upwelling in essence, um, bringing up nutrient rich water from the bottom. Um, So those are negative numbers. And then uh, conversely, uh, downwelling, uh, again, a little confusing, is represented by a positive number. And in this particular case, the sea level has risen and then we'll be flushing uh, you know, water down, not so much a nutrient rich area. Um, but more important than downwellings and upwellings is finding them uh, and also representing or recognizing that there's uh, eddies typically that are attached to them. So in an upwelling, you got a counterclockwise eddy or current and a downwelling, you get a clockwise current, but the areas in between really are the key here. And the areas in between are called convergence zones. And that really is only true of those upwellings and downwellings that are immediately next to each other and that have pretty rapidly transitioning Uh, contour lines. So you can see the contour in the middle that says zero. And then on either side of that, um, it's either a downwelling or an upwelling. And these areas tend to attract bait and trap bait. And of course, then become predator friendly, uh, attractive to the pet predators that are hunting on that bait. So you're looking for those areas between, you know, negative two and positive two, um, where they, uh, you know, establish themselves next to each other together. All right, any question on any of the slides that we just covered um, in that segment? And if not, no big deal. We'll just keep going and uh, just keep the questions coming if you got them. So I know some of these things are not immediately intuitive and and, uh, may may even be a little confusing, but we wanna make sure we're clarifying any of that on this call tonight. All right. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about weed lines. Uh, this is one of the great new features. That's also one of the probably more popular features of fish mapping. And with the, <clears throat> excuse me, weed lines feature turned on, basically you're going to get these magenta colors on screen that are identifying where the weeds are. Uh, and the way weeds are identified is from satellite. Uh, we have a satellite that's looking at imagery, looking at the reflectivity of the water. And we've determined that the reflectivity changes when weeds are present. So the weed data is updated daily um, and shapes are not an exact representation. Basically what happens here is a software algorithm looks at the imagery and then it gets passed over to a oceanographer for for final review and they kind of take a highlighter and trace the areas where there are as a high probability of weeds. So that's how those images wind up being looking the way they do on screen. Now, um, <clears throat> some other key things to know about uh, the weeds is they are uh, they can't be shown very effectively within 20 miles of a shore. Um, the, there's, there's too much uh, interference and uh, it would, they wouldn't be very accurate. 
Um, so we've masked uh, close to shore, except in areas like where the Keys, where there isn't a whole lot of shore going on to speak of. But in most areas, you're not going to see weeds appearing until if, un unless you're more than 20 miles out. So th something to keep in mind. Um, next is there, that, that color uh, of weed does change. Uh, there are three colors, um, and that helps to denote the, the ages of, of the weeds. So we've got a, a lighter magenta color for ones that are uh, a couple of days old. Because weeds move around so much, we've put three days worth of weed information into the feed. So we're looking at uh, two days ago, and then we're looking at um, uh, more current information as the color darkens. So that's how the, uh, the information is displayed. Um, and then you can also turn on a loop feature. So you can see the three days play out as a loop. So if we turn the loop on, we can see the weeds moving around uh, over the, over the three-day period and able to kind of figure out if they're, if they're breaking up or if they're dispersing. Uh, another thing to know about weeds is because this is using, you know, satellite imagery technology, cloud cover will block the image. So you may see the weeds completely disappear for a day if it's been cloudy. Um, and fortunately, you know, you've got two other days that you can rely on to kind of figure out where they, where they had been. And of course, you know, weeds do bunch and then they also do tend to break apart. So, you know, being able to see those three days, you're getting a better idea of how they're working, but you do still have to kind of put some logic into it. So if you see that they've been, you know, moving a certain direction uh, when you're heading out, you might want to head out to a point somewhere in front and work your way back towards where they were last were, um, because, you know, we know they, they aren't stationary for very long. So that's how the, uh, the weed, inform weed information displays. Next, we're gonna go to fishing recommendations. So we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar that uh, fishing recommendations are updated twice a day, uh, twice a week, I'm sorry. There is a lot of work that goes into producing these recommendations. Basically what we've got is uh, every species has a specific recipe of water temperature, plankton conditions, salinity, winds, have you. The oceanographers have a laundry list for each species. And if all the boxes get ticked for a particular species, then they will uh, basically put a mark on screen and will identify that and say, you know, there's a high probability of that species being in this area. And this is not based on catch reports. It's based purely on science. So we're saying, you know, this is the this is where the most favorable conditions exist for that species. So something to keep keep in mind. Um, that's why they're not always showing up everywhere all the time. Yep, and we do ask that in the absence of fishing recommendations, which happens quite frequently, where you'll go off fishing and you won't see any recommendations in your area, please use the other features. Um, and, and really in general, I would say, don't rely as much on fishing recommendations as you would on something like plankton fronts and sea surface temperature fronts uh, put together. Of course, your bathymetry is, is critical too, is all you know. Yeah, this is just one of the tools in the tool belt and we suggest you use them in combination with others. And we'll touch on combinations a little bit. And here's a perfect example. Um, here we've combined the plankton front strength and the temperature front strength. And uh, this is without a doubt, one of the most productive uh, features you could have. If you could get an, on an area where there is both a sea surface, strong sea surface temperature front and a strong plankton front, where those red and green lines come together, I like to say it's like Christmas. There's almost a guarantee that there's gonna be bait fish activity in that area. Uh, the other thing that, that I found uh, out working on these fronts is that uh, you'll oftentimes see a little bit of a rip current and possibly a little bit of a collection of weeds caused by what's happening here. And when I say weeds, it's not weeds big enough that we're able to see from satellites so we can show you that they're on screen. And also it may be you know, well within 20 miles of shore, but this little rip caused by these fronts causes those smaller weeds to collect. Which, by the way, is exactly what Ryan was talking about a little while ago, where the confluence of these things happened and he found a boat and some floating matter there that was really attractive to the fishing area. 
right? You know, a lot of this is driven by ocean currents and, and, and wind conditions and, and, and the, you know, the upwelling and downwelling. It all comes together and, and forms uh, this type of information and you'll, you're able to see it happening right here. And here's another prime example. Uh, the, I've overlaid the fishing recommendations and you can see how they typically follow the temperature fronts and the plankton fronts all here on the same screen. And you'll see this quite often. And the other thing to keep in mind here is uh, the fishing recommendations come out on Tuesday mornings and Friday mornings. So if you're running out on a Tuesday and Friday, that's nice, good current information. But if you're running out, let's say on Sunday and you see the fishing recommendations, but you see the temperature fronts and plankton fronts have moved off. In this case, they've moved off a little bit to the east. Well, probably want to work those fronts or maybe work between those two, because this is, you know, this is proving that some of that information is, is, is this, this information is updated daily. So this is more current on a Sunday than this information is. And that's something to keep in, keep in mind. Again, you have to use all the tools in the tool belt. So again, here's another example. I've just put the sea surface temperature front layer on. I'm gonna add the plankton front layer and then add the fishing recommendations right on top. And you can see how that comes into, comes into play. And that's the area where you wanna be. Uh, another uh, question we frequently get asked is about the bathymetry. And right now, uh, Garmin units do not allow you to overlay the fish mapping information on top of the bathymetry. Uh, so you can still get that information by going split screen like you see here. And if you look at that <clears throat> contiguous zone line, that's in the exact same place on both parts. So I can see where that arch is right there. And right here, I can see where that's coming right into my plankton front and my temperature fronts and my fishing recommendations. So that's right now the only way to get the bathymetry to be able to compare the bathymetry to the fish mapping information. And just so everybody knows, I mean, Garmin intentionally left bathymetry off of the fish mapping charts just to minimize clutter. Uh, having that many contour lines appearing simultaneously could be really like looking at a you know, bowl of spaghetti, if you will. And I don't see any from you guys uh, at this point, but um, but we will stop one more time, I think, for questions. And we did get a few people that joined late. Um, they may not have heard if you, you there is no voice uh, open, but uh, you can click on the chat uh, button there and you can chat us a question and we will respond to it. And by the way, we will be recording this um, and sending it out to everybody who registered. All right, the Garmin GXM54 is the weather receiver. It has been out in the market for two and a half years now. This is the only Garmin weather receiver that enables fish mapping. Uh, the current MSRP is 849. Um, Sirius XM has a rebate off of the hardware. Fairly easy to sign up. You just need to buy the weather receiver, show proof of purchase, install it, uh, subscribe, and then go to SiriusXM.com forward slash marine rebate. And we will, once we validate your information, we'll send you a $100 Visa gift card. Um, we do have an active one month trial of fish mapping. So for anybody who signed up and wants fish mapping, we'll give you fish mapping for free for the first month. Um, and you can do, you can call to activate at this 844-342-0665. Important that you don't just go into SiriusXM.com and, and, and dial into the 1-800 number. Um, we want to specifically have you contact um, somebody in the marine uh, field, not just general automotive, because uh, it can get confusing. And one last thing, the GXM54, when you buy it, uh, includes all the parts that you see here. There's an antenna, and then there's a small black box that uh, installs behind the dash. Uh, one of the wires plugs into the back of your mm -hmm. chart plotter or your Ethernet port. Another one goes up the antenna. And then if you're doing the uh, getting the audio service, the other one would go over to your stereo system. But everything is included in that GXM54 box. All right, Dal, you want to take us through how to get software updates? Yeah, we have a couple of ways to, to get your units up to date. And it's very important that you guys are continuing to 
um, get get your 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 units up to date. Um, so we fix glitches, we add features. So um, there's a couple ways you can do it. Of course, if you have the Active Captain app, you can go into the Active Captain app and upload the uh, latest software. And then when you, when you get to your vessel, you can download it to the chart plotter. You can also use, uh, uh, do the software update from Garmin.com and you can go into Marine and then click on Marine software. And you can see what the latest software update is. Um, you can see what we changed, what we fixed. Uh, and if you're, you know, if you haven't done your software update in a couple of months, uh, uh, or, you know, the past year, if you do the latest software update, it will back update all your, all the past software updates. So you'll be good to go. Um, so that's, that's probably what I definitely recommend. Make sure you're doing your software updates. And if you want to be able to find where your soft date, where update is on the chart plotter, uh, you can go to options. Um, then you can go into your settings, communication and then Marine Network. And here you can see we have the latest software update. We're at 27.10 on the chart plotter, and then we're at 3.10 on the GXM54. Uh, anything that's plugged into your network port via this route, you're gonna see what your software is, uh, is. And once you do your current software update on your chart plotter, it's gonna automatically feed all the new software updates to all the components you have plugged into a Garmin MFD. Um, so fish mapping, as I already mentioned, is a superset, which includes all of our offshore weather features, which in and of itself is what, $59.99, $60. So for an additional $40, you get the additional eight fish mapping features. Uh, it's a fixed cost. It doesn't, uh, we don't charge you extra for data. Uh, it's just a fixed cost monthly. Uh, and then we do encourage people to do seasonal suspend. If you are not using your boat, if your boat's up on the hard or getting worked on, there's no point in paying for a subscription uh, when you're not using the boat. So seasonally suspend as opposed to deactivating. Seasonally suspend more or less just puts your account in escrow on hold. Um, and you, when you call in to put it on seasonally suspend, you can tell the call agent, I want it turned back on on X date within six months. Uh, versus deactivating, having to call back in, reset up your account, pay an activation fee. Um, you get the idea. So seasonal sp suspend is the way to go. Uh, also encourage people uh, when you're offshore, you don't have tunes. Uh, terrestrial radio goes out. And if you have tunes on a CD or on your phone, I can guarantee you they get old fast. Been there, done that. Uh, so Sirius XM will come into your boat via the GXM54 weather receiver. Um, and you can control it that way. And by pairing your radio uh, or adding it to the same subscription, you get a reduced uh, cost as well. It's roughly 30% uh, savings on your stereo or on, excuse me, on your Sirius XM radio when you add it to your weather or fish mapping program. All right, last but not least, or one of the last things, um, we encourage everybody to join Dolphin Research Project, um, Dolphin Fish Research Program, really, is in its uh, DRP is the initials. Uh, it, they're doing critical work. This is a nonprofit doing critical work to analyze dolphin fish in the ocean. Uh, and they're encouraging people to sign up to get free tagging kits. And the small mahi that you're throwing back, or maybe you've caught your limit, or maybe you just don't want that many mahi, um, put a tag in them. Uh, it's simple. Uh, once you get good at it, a uh, minute, minute and a half, they have how-to videos on this. Um, but the data captured from mahi uh, by tagging them and then actually having somebody catch one of those tags and figure out where it went, how far it went, how much it's grown, et cetera, uh, is really critical for the longevity and, and uh, you know, research being going on for, for dolphin fish. So go to dolphintagging.com forward slash tags. There you'll be able to sign up to get a free tagging kit with all the details and information you need. And we'd really appreciate if people, uh, you know, take the initiative to, to uh, help tag. And then uh, Marine Resources page. Um, you're probably familiar with our website, series6m.com forward slash marine, which is our general marine website, series6m.com forward slash fish mapping, which is our fish mapping website. But probably more important than any is the video library. 
And that's SiriusXM.com forward slash Marine Library right here in the middle. There is a Garmin tab. Click on the Garmin tab. And every bit of content that Dan and I have created that is educational, um, not just kind of hype, but educational how-to videos, webinars, et cetera, there's a, it's chock full of content. So um, highly recommend people go there and uh, watch those videos. They're easy and they're easy to digest. So, uh, and then of course, follow us on social media, facebook.com forward slash Sirius XM Marine and at Sirius XM underscore Marine. Love to hear your stories. Love to see your pictures, um, tag us, et cetera. And then last but not least, if anybody has any serious related technical questions, you're having service issues, you're, you're having some kind of glitches, and you believe it's with your SiriusXM system, um, please email us, marine.support at SiriusXM.com. This is much better than going through the call center. Uh, you will get somebody to respond to typically within 24 hours, sometimes a lot sooner, um, and you know help you problem solve. Um, and then if you have Garmin hardware specific issues or problems, uh, marine.training at garmin.com.